Professor Blitzstein is a professor of the practice of statistics. He is known for teaching the popular class, STAT 110, Introduction to Probability, which holds over 300 students each fall. He also has over 200,000 subscribers to the class on iTunes U. His research interests focus on statistical inference for complex networks. Professor Blitzstein also enjoys chess and advises the Harvard Chess Club. Please join us in welcoming Professor Blitzstein. Thank you all for, for coming. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, let's get started right away. My, the title of my talk is The Soul of, of Statistics. Uh, let's start with, with, with a motivating example before I tell you what I think the soul of statistics is. So the, Abraham Wald w w was a famous statistician, and um, during World War II, too many British bombers were, were being shot down by the Nazis, so, so he was cons consulting with, with them about try, try, trying to figure out where to put more armor. You know, they want to put more armor, but the armor is heavy and expensive. They can't just put armor everywhere, so where do you put, put the armor? Okay, so I drew some airplanes here. These don't really look like the bombers, but, but that's okay. Um, so, um, so, so here's some airplanes, and I just drew, drew some bullet holes. Uh, there, there's one. Um, um, sorry, I, I didn't have a warning that there would there be a graphic violence here, so hopefully no one is too squeamish. There's another one, another one, another one. Bam, 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 bam. Uh, so these are just, I just made up some, some bullet holes on, on these planes, and th these are the planes that they, they get to observe. They're, okay, uh, just, just as an example. And so, so they brought in Wall to ask, you know, where, where should they be put, putting more armor? Well, <coughs> The obvious thing to do is, is you know, look at where all, all their, the, the planes are sustaining heavy, heavy damage and ar armor the, the, those regions more. However, Wald said to do the exact opposite. Look for the parts of the planes where there is n very little or no damage on the planes that, 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 that came back. The reason is, so, so for this example, I, I protected the, the, the nose on, on, on all, all of these planes. And so what's really going on here well, what we're really interested in is the planes that we didn't see. Those are the planes that, that didn't come back. The ones that you actually get to see are the planes that actually survived well enough to, to, to return. So, so there, there, there's, there's some, some statistical th thinking in there. How do, you, how do you learn about the planes you don't get to see? And you know, that requires some, some statistical assumptions and statistical thinking about what, what do you do about, about the, the, the missing da data, right? So maybe what if it looks like, like this? That the, 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 this plane, we didn't get to see it because that's like the, the Achilles heel or the, or the Achilles nose of, of, the, of the plane. And may, maybe there's like, like a whole army of these like, <laughs> like uh, Rudolph the, the, the red-nosed air, aircraft that we don't get to see any of them because that they, they all died and we only saw the other ones. So that's where you put the armor. So, 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 so that, that was the idea. It's a pretty simple idea in retrospect, but, but easy to, to miss if you're not thinking s statistically. Okay, so that's an example of what's called selection bias in statistics. What we, what we know about is what we get to see, which is where the bullet holes are distributed for the planes that actually return. But that's not what we're interested in. We want to know about the planes that didn't make it back. Okay, so, so how do we link the, those two things? That, 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 that's a statistical problem. Now we're ready to say, what's the soul of statistics? I won't keep you in suspense. Conditioning is the soul of statistics. That means conditional probability, for those of you who know what that is, if you don't know what conditional probability, all it means is, 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 is that we're given information. We, we, all, we always have Im information where, wherever we're doing. It's, it's all conditional on the information we, we have. And conditional probability tells us how to update our beliefs ba based on Im information that, that we're able to observe. Every probability is, is, is conditional. And so, so that, that's the point of view here. Whenever you have a data set, you want to think about how it was sampled. So, so this is just a picture that I'm not really going to talk about of, of a network, which is something I work on, where a lot, there's a huge amount of interest in networks these days. But a lot of that work ignores where did the network come from? How, how is it sampled? And that can lead to, to very misleading answers if, if, if you ignore the sampling, if, you, if you're not careful about what you're, you're conditioning on. And you know, I, this is supposed to be Harvard thinks big, so, so I'm going to try to think really big. That this is not just the soul of statistics. This this is everything because 
we wouldn't be, if what I said was not true, we wouldn't be here having this conversation. It's all conditional on a huge conditional probability calculation that we can't actually do of things that, that, that brought us to, the, to, to this room to have this conversation right now. E everything is conditional. Okay, so, so here's, a, here's another example. Uh, this is a longevity study from, from 1835. Uh, Lombard was, was, was interested in, in, in collecting huge amounts of data, a very impressive data collection effort for how long people in different professions lived. Okay, so I'll just give you a, a few, few, I chose a, a few examples. That, that's a selection bias too, the ones that I felt like choosing because, because, because it's a short talk. So here's the profession, here's the average longevity in his data set. So it turned out that the first or second longest living people in his data set were chocolate makers. <laughs> so I was very happy to, to see that because I really like chocolate. They lived to be 73.6, which, you know, lifespans have improved from 1835 to now, so that's actually quite good back then. And uh, this is not second on the list, but, but one that I was interested in was professors <laughs> lived to be 66.6. .6. So, I, I know, it's a little bit sad. You know, I, I could have, if I had chosen a different career path, I could have lived seven years longer and had all the chocolate th th that I want. <laughs> um, there is a sample size issue here, which is he, he only had nine chocolate makers in his sample. That's a very small sample. There are a lot more professors than, than chocolate makers in, in his study. But anyway, I, I want, let's go on. Clocksmiths lived to be 55.3, so that, that's less attractive. Locksmiths, 47.2. I was trying to figure out what, what, why is there this discrepancy between clocksmiths and locksmiths? So what, what, what could explain this? I don't have an answer yet. One more that is of interest to all of us is students. Um, unfortunately, I have some bad news for, for all the students here. Uh, in his study, he found the average longevity of students is 20.2 <laughs> years. So uh, I, I didn't want to be like, get this event off to a depressing start. I'm, I'm, I'm the first speaker, and I don't want everyone to be too depressed to pay attention to the other talks that are coming up. Uh, 20.2 years, you know, it's worrisome. Um, I recommend that if you haven't seen Steve Jobs' uh, commencement address from Stanford 2005, uh, I, I was there because I was at Stanford. It's a great talk, thanks. Uh, and, um, you know, about living it each day to, to the max and, and all that. <laughs> okay, but there's an obvious problem with that, with that logic, right? W which is, you know, what are you conditioning on? You know, a, a student, you know, 20 years old is, is a normal age for a, for, a, for a student. Okay, so it's kind of obvious to see what goes wrong. It's a good example of looking at an extreme case because the, in the, the earlier professions, it's not obvious that there are all ki kinds of biases going on, but when you see the simple and extreme case of a student, you can see that the whole thing is very suspicious. There's another issue, uh, oh, I wanted to mention one more thing about that, uh, about censoring, which, which is that we only know how long people lived after they died. Okay, so usually it's a lot harder to talk to dead people than to talk to live people, and Professor Dench will be telling us about talking to, to dead people in detail. <laughs> but this is one case where it's much easier to, 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 to deal with the dead people because we know how long they lived. Okay, so there's a, lo a lo large amount of statistical survival analysis um, is a field to, to try, try, try to deal with the fact that we don't know how long the living people are going to continue to live, and if, we don't, if we're not careful about that, we're going to get some bad bias. All right, one more example, which is, which is a very famous one in statistics, is regression towards the mean, and it, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, so, so, so just to take an example, if, if you're not familiar with this, uh, take test scores. So you have a gr group of students who take the SAT, and then su su suppose that, that the, the ones who did really well take it again, and the ones who did really poorly take it again. So we're doing a, a selection, okay? Well. Regression towards the mean says that we expect that the, one, the students who did really well on the SAT, when they retake it, their scores are going to tend to go down towards the mean. The ones who did really poorly are going to go up. There's examples everywhere. Uh, one of the first examples, I'm not going to go through this data table here, but that, that's just for historical curiosity. Uh, S Sir Francis Galton, who was a cousin of uh, Darwin, was one of the first, or possibly the first pe person to, to clearly explain regression towards the mean. And he, he discovered it by, by studying heights, parents and children's heights. And he found that, you know, for example, if you look at fathers and sons, so we don't have to work, uh, worry about uh, differences uh, 
gender differences in heights. Let's just take fathers and sons. Okay, so he looked at, at, at very tall fathers. How tall are their sons? Well, the sons are still pretty tall, but they were regressing towards the mean. Okay, and very short fathers, their sons tend to be taller, not, not all the way to the mean. This is regression toward the mean, not to the mean, but it's moving in that direction. That phenomenon is, is everywhere in, in statistics and in life, so if you have your eyes open to, to look for it, that's a good thing. And so um, I just want to quickly quote uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, because it's, it's a beautiful quote uh, about regression towards the mean. He said, I had the most satisfying eureka experience of my career while attempting to teach flight instructors that praise is more effective than punishment for promoting skill learning. And when he gave that talk, a flight instructor objected, on many occasions I've praised flight cadets for clean execution of some aer aerobatic maneuver, and in general, when they try it again, they do worse. On the other hand, I've often screamed at cadets for bad execution, and then they do better the next time. So don't tell me that reinforcement works and punishment does not. And Kahneman said that's a joyous moment be because he, what, he, what he realized is we tend to reward others when they do well and punish them when they do badly. And because there's regression to the mean, he should say toward the mean, it is part of the human condition that we are statistically punished for rewarding others and rewarded for punishing them. And uh, so there are a lot of misconceptions about uh, regression toward the mean that, that, I, that I don't have time to get into detail of, but I wanted to get, do a quick li li little picture illustrating what, what, uh, a, a hypothetical thought experiment, what would the world be like without regression toward the mean? Because a lot of people seem to have the misconception that regression toward the mean would mean that e everyone is gonna be you know, eventually converging to the, to the same value. And actually, without regression to toward the mean, uh, we need regression toward the mean in order to have stability in, in the population. So I just made up a simple example where suppose we had three people, three different heights, and suppose each person has a chi child who's equally likely to be a little bit shorter, the same height, or a little bit taller. Okay, so I just gave them three, three kids each. A sh little shorter, same height, a little bit taller. So that's the next generation. Then I just took that generation and just, just re re rearranged it. These are the same people. Now, same thing happens again. That's the next generation. And then I'll just take one, one more generation. This is, this is what the population would look like without regression toward the mean. What you see is after only three or four generations, you know, you're, you're going to see giant, you know, 10-foot people walking around, and you have li li little four-inch pe people, things <laughs> like that. That's what the world would be like without regression toward the mean. Okay, lastly, I want to tie this back to, to, to just kind of personal perspective on teaching and research, which is something I call the conditional golden rule. So this was a course evaluation I got uh, in the Q guide a few years ago. Um, so, so someone wrote, it was a class, this is about stat 110, it was a class that was designed by Blitz with the credo, I wanted to teach a class that I would want to take myself. So I was really happy when, when, I, when I saw that, because it, well, it was a nice comment, but it also reminded me of something that I had forgotten that I had said, and I kind of liked I liked that. Um, <laughs> however, uh, in, in, in the interest of full disclosure, that same year there was also a comment that said, writes horrible problem sets that only cause pain, not learning. <laughs> so unfortunately, I, I, I try to be logical. The, the logical conclusion from these two things is that I'm a masochist. Um, <laughs> so let me just. So let me just tell you what the conditional golden rule is, and then I'll stop. Th th this is my philosophy of teaching, in, in a nutshell. Do unto others as you would have do unto you, except it, it's conditional, right? Everything is conditional. It, it's the class that I would take c conditionally on having the, the, the same interests and, and background and, and, and knowledge. So I just try to do the conditional go golden rule. I'm trying to follow it right now in giving this talk. And if I failed, uh, blame the conditional golden rule. Or blame, or blame the fact that conditional probability is hard, as, as we see in STAT 110. It, it's hard, but, but it's worth thinking about. Okay. So I just want to th th thank the organizers and, and thank my colleagues, especially Carl Morris, Shaoli Meng, and Dave Harrington, and all my STAT 110 students and TFs, and all of you for coming. Thank you.